Uh, well, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Rob Atkinson, President of ITIF. I want to welcome you to this event uh, for a report that ITIF is releasing today, articulating, uh, I think, a pretty new and, and innovative and groundbreaking framework for thinking about global internet policy conflicts. Uh, this is an area that people have been speculating on and working on for at least a decade, but I don't think with a a lot of progress, uh, in part because it's a thorny question and it's a complicated question that gets wrapped up in the internet governance itself, issues around ICANN, for example. Uh, but it's broader than that and it encompasses not just internet architecture but a whole set of policies around that every government in the world is struggling with of what's the right policy framework domestically around internet policy. And countries have different approaches to that. And so inherently, because the internet is a cross-border medium, uh, it entails a significant number of conflicts. And I think it's important to understand how those conflicts should play out, what's appropriate for countries to do, what's not appropriate. And that's what we're trying to do today. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over uh, to Daniel Castro, uh, who will lead us off. I'll just introduce all our panelists first. Um, Daniel leads ITIF's work on uh, internet policy. He's also the director of our Center for Data Innovation and has a long, long background in IT, including uh, being at GAO and uh, a degree in computer science from Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, joining us from uh, probably the, the farthest point on Earth that one can get uh, and still being on the planet, uh, we're really honored that uh, Senator Stephen Conroy is joining us by the magic of Skype. So, Senator, thank you. Uh, for those of you who don't know uh, Stephen Conroy, he, he is really one of the global leaders on thinking about ICT policy and broadband policy. Uh, he is the deputy leader of the opposition in the Australian Senate and uh, was the Minister for Broadband Communications and Digital Economy in the second Gillard uh, ministry um, uh, until, until, he, uh, he, until he resigned. Uh, he has been with the Australian Labor Party uh, and a member of the Australian Senate since 1996, representing the state of Victoria. So uh, we really appreciate you joining us because it's late, late your time. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, with you. Great. Uh, Gordon Goldstein should be joining us. <coughs> Gordon is managing director and head of, uh, <coughs> excuse me, external affairs at Silver Lake <coughs> Partners. Uh, which is a New York investment firm, and in particular, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Gordon represented Silver Lake as a member of the U.S. government uh, and industry delegation to the World Conference on International <coughs> Telecommunications, the ITU conference, where uh, this was all hashed out or attempted to be hashed out a while ago. Uh, Morgan Reed is executive director for the Association of Competitive Technology. Uh, Morgan's one of the real leaders in Washington on thinking about and acting on a whole set of these internet and ICT policies, particularly around IP policy. Uh, Morgan has a long background uh, in this space, including in industry, a uh, fluent Chinese speaker, uh, worked for a Taiwanese trading company. So Morgan's going to actually give his speech in Mandarin today <laughs> in the spirit of this internet. That's how the audience will appreciate that. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, and lastly, uh, Jackie Ruff, who is Vice President of International Public Policy and Regulatory Affairs for Verizon Communications. Uh, Jackie, again, has a long, long background in this space. She directs uh, activity uh, for Verizon in, at a number of international forums, including the ITU, APEC, the International Governance Forum, and OECD. She's a member, um, as I am, uh, the U.S. Coordinator for International Communications and Information Policy at the Department of State and also to the USTR. Uh, she uh, joined Verizon after being in the International Bureau of the FCC and uh, also uh, had a, was involved in a law practice before that doing international law. So I'm going to kick it off with Daniel and he'll make remarks for about 15 or 20 minutes then we'll open up for comments and then we'll have discussion. Great. Well, thank you, Rob, and, and thanks to the panelists for joining us today and for all of you for being here. Um, and just for anyone that got here late, we, we did not lie when we said there was lunch. It's in this room, so if you came in late, feel free to go up there. Daniel, what's the hashtag? I uh, hashtag be. internet policy. Hashtag internet policy. Thank you, back audience person. So. <laughs> yeah, so if you're um, 
if you're watching the stream, you're, you're welcome to submit questions uh, on Twitter using the hashtag internet policy. Uh, so as Rob said, there's always been this really big question confronting countries. You know, how do we govern the internet? This, um, you know, it's a massive global network, spans countries, it crosses traditional legal boundaries. How do we deal with this really challenging question? And traditionally, there's been these two answers. So one approach is to say, let's all have the same rules. Let's kind of take one universal approach to the internet. And there's generally two ways of doing this. So one way is to say that the one universal rule should be that there are no rules, that you know, government should just keep its hands off the internet. Um, and then the other approach is to kind of have a country come forth with its own set of values and principles and say, we want all countries to adopt this. So we want freedom of expression. We want openness and democracy. We want protection of children. We want respect for privacy. And this is generally how a lot of the debates and fights over internet policy have gone. The second approach is to go in the completely opposite direction and just say, well, let's have each country do its own thing. And so you know, the problem with the first approach is, of course, that not all countries agree on what the universal principle should be. And the problem with the second approach is that you can't have a, a global connected network if you don't agree on, on the same, uh, same principles about how the network should work. So what we do in this report is we propose a hybrid. Uh, that combines elements of, elements of each approach. And so I'll, I'll get into kind of how this works. But I think a, a useful analogy here is to think of a, a game, uh, pretty much an eSports. So if you want to play a game, competitors have to come together and they have to agree on the basic rules. Right? You don't get very far if one team wants to play American football and the other team wants to play soccer. You have to have a common foundation. You have to have some kind of basic principles that you agree to. But competitors don't have to agree on strategies, right? You don't have to agree on tactics. You don't have to agree if you want to pay, play more offense or defense. Um, and this is actually this is really important. You don't, you don't need to agree. You can actually have big disagreements. As long as you're playing by the same rules, you can have your own strategies. And it doesn't matter who's wrong or right. Um, you can argue with another team as much as you want. They're not going to change their mind if they just want to play the other way. The only thing that matters is that you have the same rules. And so the same is really true in internet policy. So the first thing that we argue in the paper is that we should separate out conflicts about the rules of the game, in this case meaning the core internet architecture, what the, uh, you know, the domain name system, how it all functions, from conflicts over strategy, conflicts over how content should be regulated, conflicts over privacy, security, all these other issues. And nations should agree at the outset that there needs to be certain universal principles. Um, related to really how the network works, and that these principles shouldn't be changed without consensus. So this is why ICANN has been so um, so useful, I think, because it's really dealing with technical questions, and that's when it has worked well. And second, and if, if you're following along in the paper, uh, this is all outlined, I think, very briefly on page 13. We have a diagram there. We really need to distinguish between goals of policy and the means. So we need to distinguish between uh, what a policy is trying to accomplish with how it's actually trying to do it. So one of the key questions to ask with any proposal is to say, you know, does it affect individuals outside the country? Does it affect businesses outside the country? If the impact is purely domestic, uh, then really countries should more or less be allowed to pursue these types of policies, right? They're, this is when every country can kind of do its own thing. But if the impact is felt outside the borders, uh, which is often the case, then countries need to look further. And so the next step is really to look at international commitments. So if you look at international commitments, you can see if it's in conflict with any binding commitments that a country already has, such as free trade agreements. If it's in conflict, then the policy should not be pursued. And if there's debate over whether or not there is a conflict, which of course is a central question here, um, then it should be uh, resolved in the appropriate forum. So for example, conflicts over trade can be resolved in the WTO. You Traditionally, when you have a binding agreement, you have these kind of uh, in the agreement, it says how you, how you go about resolving these types of debates. If the policy is not in conflict, then the final question really here is, are there informal consensus? Is there informal consensus in some way? And so what I mean by that is, you know, is there, for example, non-binding agreements that countries have? Do you see a lot of countries moving in a certain direction? Uh, because if there's not consensus, there's really no reason that a country should be taking actions that impact individuals outside the borders. That's kind of a, a rule of the game that we should all be able to agree to. But if there is consensus, then countries can be allowed or should be allowed uh, to take some actions as long as they're minimizing the impact. But the really, I think, interesting insight that you get from this framework and get to 
at this point is if there is informal consensus, if countries want to be doing this, this is an area where we can develop more universal principles. This is an area where we can try and change the rules of the game uh, because everyone's really in agreement. This is where we can develop more internet policy in ways that we haven't in the past. So again, you know, the point of the framework is really to provide a useful way at looking at the type of conflicts that we see arising between different nations. And again, it's, it's really important to distinguish between disagreements over values and disagreements over implementation or the means that are being used. And you know, I really want to emphasize here that you know, the point of this isn't to suggest that you know, the United States shouldn't be promoting its values like free speech uh, or democracy or to excuse a totalitarian government that, that wants to do things that we don't do. <coughs> the point here is to really recognize that sometimes there are fundamental disagreements over values. And you know, the United States, for example, and Europe are not going to see eye to eye on censoring hate speech. right? You know, these, are, these are countries and groups of countries that simply have different values. But we should still be able to come to the table and have useful dialogue over these issues. And we need to be pragmatic about how we approach these conflicts. We can't, um, you know, you basically have to choose your battles. We also need to make sure that when there are areas for cooperation, when there are areas where we can coordinate our policy, um, for example, around fighting online crime, right? Uh, for example, fighting uh, spam, which we haven't done a lot to do, uh, we haven't done a lot working internationally, collaborating across borders um, to address these issues. We need to think about what new forms we can create to do this. I really want to emphasize this last point because, you know, for the last year or so, um, so much of the conversation has been on ICANN when you talk about internet governance, right? All eyes are on ICANN right now. Um, but when we think about, you know, where future decisions will be made that impact internet governance, so many of them might be made in other forums. And we really need to be thinking about these other forums. We need to be asking whether countries like the United States and others are leaders in creating these forums or leading voices in these other forums, uh, because they should be if they want to control the agenda. So I think of the panel discussion, we're going to jump into some of these examples. But let me let me stop there for a minute and invite some of our other. We should do a couple of examples, maybe the Malaysian one, or the Australian one, or something. I think that's. Yeah. So if we want to run through one of the examples, and we have a bunch of these, uh, for example, in the paper, we talk about how um, how you can go through and apply this framework. Um, so actually, let me use uh, Google's right to be forgotten, uh, and this isn't in the paper, but it's something that's you know very much on people's minds right now. Um, so, you know, right to be forgotten, in my opinion, and I think in a lot of other people's opinion, is a, is a bad policy. You know, it's, it's not good for um, access to information. It's not good for innovation and, and companies. There's a recent report that came out that talked about the uh, negative impact that it will have on Europe's GDP. Um, but still, you know, Europe has said that it wants to generally uh, pursue this policy. So the question is, you know, what kind of impact does this have outside the borders? And you know, when you look at the policy, there's different ways that it can be implemented. This is why implementation really matters when we're evaluating the policies. So it's not enough that you know, as a as a U.S. citizen or you know, obviously with the U.S. government, to say this is a bad policy for all these reasons. That's a conflict of our values. The question is to say what impact is it having outside the borders. And so there's different ways that it can be implemented. This is actually under debate right now. So if, if European countries say you know we want to make this very limited in scope. Um, we want to make sure this is only applied to European citizens and how, you know, what information's uh, removed. Uh, we want to only do it when, you know, Google maybe has a presence in our country. Uh, we want to only do it to the uh, country code top level domain. So, you know, google.co.uk or google.fr and not uh, google.com. You know, if they want to limit it in that way, you know, maybe they can, you know, carve out enough uh, of an exemption to say that it's appropriate. Um, but if it's not, if they want to, you know, push out the European values to the rest of the world, that's when it doesn't work. That's when we have these types of conflicts. Um, you know, another example of this uh, uh, kind of working through this framework is the debate over, um, you know, whether the United States uh, should have banned um, access to online gambling. Right. So there are these um, overseas casinos, and, and there was conflict over whether or not this was appropriate. So. Clearly, this was having an impact uh, overseas, um, but the question was, you know, was this a, a debate over uh, free trade? Was it a restriction on trade that the U.S. was doing, or was it a restriction on, uh, you know, a, a core U.S. principle that was saying we shouldn't have online gambling? 
that this was a problem. Now, we might disagree over the outcomes, but the process was to take this to the WTO and have it resolved in the WTO. And the point was, you know, this was, you know, at least to one country's opinion, this was a debate over uh, trade. And so it should have been resolved in a trade forum, and, and there was a process to do that. And the point of this paper is to say, when you look at these issues in that way, that's the appropriate way to, to think about them. Um, you know, where is it having an impact? Is there another forum where we can resolve these issues? And can we create a forum to do that? Uh, so great, so let me, let me stop there. Um, first, we're gonna um, <coughs> turn it over to Senator Conroy, and then we're gonna work through our panelists. Um, but we're looking for some interesting reactions. So, Senator Conroy. Hey, everyone. Uh, could I firstly uh, congratulate Daniel and Rob for the paper and organizing the forum. This has been a, a subject uh, I have been deeply involved in for 10 years at both the policy and an architectural level. Uh, I, before you today is the internet villain of the year for 2011, uh, and also the uh, architect of Australia's national broadband network, a $40 billion uh, investment in building a fiber of the home network. So the internet community are very confused about me. Uh, they've, uh, they've wanted to hate me and they've wanted to love me all at the same time. Uh, what really brought it to uh, a head for me in terms of having, realising it's such a broad issue was the American ambassador actually appeared on Australian television at one stage and declared the internet should be free like the air and the sea. <laughs> which I thought was used to the 300 or 400 years of uh, the proponents and architects of the laws of the sea, uh, and also uh, for those who spent most of the last 70 or 80 years working on the aviation laws in the world. So we shouldn't be daunted by how difficult uh, this is and that there is such an enormous difference of opinion, uh, which is why uh, the paper and the work you're doing is really important. If you look at the laws of the sea, uh, it stems from the 17th century, uh, and it, it was based on uh, the cannon shot rule, how far you could fire a cannon from your territory, which in, back in those days was about three nautical miles. Uh, it has evolved today to include navigation rights, exclusive economic zones, exploitation regimes, technological prospects, uh, even pioneer investments in protection. Uh, so there are some similarities for how uh, that debate evolved and this debate. Uh, the aviation laws are, uh, even before you get off the ground, you've got to have properly trained pilots, crews, the planes got to conform to the rules, there's got to be weight limits on baggage and passengers, how much fuel you carry, and that's before you've got off the ground. Uh, then between zero and 10,000 feet, there are rules about what you can do, where you can turn, where you can go. Uh, 20 to 30,000 feet the same uh, and then there's a the fundamental sovereignty issue around people's airspace. Uh, so when uh, an American ambassador announced that the air was free, I thought he should not uh, aviation airspace over the US, which was a novel idea. Uh, but uh, equally the United Nations in 2012 essentially passed a resolution uh, that said human rights in the digital realm must be protected and promoted with the same commitment as human rights in the physical world. In other words, you should uh, behave and govern in the same way in the digital realm as you do uh, in the physical world. And I think that's a really important principle that the UN has adopted. What are the consequences in going down the balkanised path? Uh, I led Australia's delegation uh, to Wicket uh, a couple of years ago, where the debate in Dubai was very heated. Uh, and at one point, not long before the vote, uh, Australia, the United States, Canada, and I think New Zealand were the only four votes going to be against the amendments to the ITU, regulations, rules, treaties, uh, and fortunately because the Middle Eastern countries and others overplayed their hand, uh, it ended up uh, pretty much collapsing. 
at the last minute. But that was more good luck than brilliant management by the four of us uh, that were, were there uh, having the discussions. Uh, so I think the pragmatic approach that Daniel is putting forward and Robert putting forward here is the only workable way to, to go forward. Uh, a friend of mine, a Russian official, said to me that his worst fear was that if we didn't find a framework, we didn't find some rules, that ultimately the internet would be ruled by uh, the criminals in <coughs> de facto rules. And that was why his government was so motivated uh, by wanting to put a framework or a treaty up. And what we need to recognise is that the code writers are actually rewriting sovereign laws across the planet quite regularly now, uh, even if they don't realise it. And what we're seeing is a reaction from governments around the world. The most recent one is G20, uh, not a hotbed of internet activism, but treasuries all around the world have realised that their tax base is under threat from the cloud uh, and from a whole range of uh, activities. To give an example, I think uh, here in Australia, every cup of coffee that Starbucks sells is actually a transaction that takes place in Singapore. And so governments are talking to uh, each other, they're talking to the internet community about what they can do to protect their tax bases. Nothing gets the government more motivated than protecting the tax base, I've got to tell you. Uh, equally, uh, as Daniel said, you bump into, I mean, Hillary Clinton's speech was a very well received speech uh, and advocated, you know, the, uh, your first event very strongly. Yeah. But even in Australia, uh, we wouldn't uh, and didn't uh, adopt it in the way that uh, many wanted us to. In fact, I remember having arguments with the State Department, uh, the point to the caveat that Hillary put on in her speech. There was some content that wasn't appropriate. So I've met with free speech advocates. I've met with those who campaign very strongly around the world to protect children from abuse. And I sat in the international forums and I said, look, we've got to do something about child pornography. And the first thing I'm told is, well, you can't use the word pornography, because pornography has different meanings right across uh, the world. So it's got to be child abuse. So you quickly begin to learn uh, that there are different uh, value structures that are just not going to be able to deal with. So I, I strongly endorse Daniel's approach, as uncomfortable as it is, I think the pragmatic approach uh, is going to be the only way forward. Uh, and to give you, you know, just a very tiny irritation uh, uh, about the way the internet uh, works, I spell realise with an S, not a Z, but every time I try and send the word on my iPhone, it gets zapped back to a Z. It's, it can't be that hard to design code. Uh, that uh, allows me to spell the word the way I want to. And that, that, that's just a, a tiny way of trying to illustrate the differences that the coders are, are forcing on us without even realising that they're forcing on us. So I'd stop there, I've talked too long, uh, but uh, can I, congratulations. I'd say the one model that has been put to me, and some people in this room uh, would possibly know better than me, and maybe the people at Twitter would just... Uh, uh, leading me on a bit, but Twitter have designed their, their model to allow them to take into account individual laws in individual countries. So they started from, let's accept that these changes exist and let's build our model around that. I think that is perhaps the smartest of the mo way the models have been introduced uh, around the world so far. So I might just uh, pass on from there. Thanks, Daniel. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Conroy. Um, I hope you can stay with us. Um, no, no, I'm, I'm, you're stuck with me. Beautiful. All right. Uh, so I'll turn it over to Gordon. You can do it from there or here, either one. 
No, I'll do it from here. Um, thanks to ITIF for this invitation to participate in this panel. And moreover, thanks for the work that you do here on a regular basis. I have become a uh, constant consumer of your research and your analysis. You fill a vitally important gap in the study of innovation and these key issues relating to the growth of the internet economy and um, I think you make a, a vital contribution to the policy debate. Um, in an ideal situation, a discussant such as uh, I would um, disagree with the thesis of the paper to enliven the debate. I'm sorry to disappoint you. I don't disagree with the thesis. I find myself in strong alignment with it and I didn't know though that um, uh, uh, my colleagues would make a particular appeal to me, given my background. I uh, have a doctorate in international relations, and they have concluded their paper with an homage to George Kennan and his strategy of containment, which I thought was terrifically apt. And I'll quote from it in the paper. Uh, Kennan was not accepting communism when he advocated to U.S. leaders that they try to contain the spread of communism until it died its own natural death rather than pursue the risky strategy of trying to roll it back. Kennan was being a realist. The virtue of this approach is it is a realist approach. If we look at where we are in the evolution of the internet generally, the growth of the internet economy specifically, and now the intersection of all of these disparate policy issues which are generating such diversity of global debate, You'll see a very simple thesis at work, in my opinion. The geopolitics of the internet reflects the geopolitics of the international system today. States have different interests. States have conflicting priorities. The internet is so valuable a strategic resource, just like petroleum or anything else that states covet, that it is inevitable that we're going to have uh, a collision based on different national values different national interests and different national politics. And I think the virtue of this approach is that rather, that rather than tilting at windmills and trying to create the world as we wish it to be, it acknowledges the world the way it is and increasingly so day by day as we watch this system uh, evolve. Um, the paper, however, is not pessimistic in its approach on some core issues. Basically, what the authors are arguing, if I understand it correctly, is that we should divide the internet world into those issues that fall clearly under sovereign jurisdiction and domain and not seek to fight battles that we will not prevail in, but to sequester core issues like the technical architecture of the internet and the technical co cooperation and standardization that's required to create an integrated, unitary, universal internet. Uh, and I think that is the, the right approach. And with respect to that, trying to maintain the universality of the internet, at least in terms of its technical operation, um, we have two really interesting test cases on the horizon that I wanted to invite the group to just reflect on for a moment. One is in the near term, and the other is in the, in the longer term. In the longer term, the United States announced last March that it's going to devolve its legal authority over ICANN, the entity that controls the domain name system. The United States has articulated fairly stringent conditions to effectuate this transfer, in particular that ICANN not fall under the authority or the jurisdiction of any single government or any intergovernmental institution, including but not limited to the ITU, the International Telecommunications Union of the UN system. Whether we meet that standard, the debate that follows, um, whether ICANN will remain a non-political technical organization that ensures the navigation and reliability of the internet, it's a big question. It's a big question for the future of the internet and the internet economy. We don't know how it's going to turn out. That's a longer term issue that I think is going to play out over the next 24, 36, 48 months. The other issue that will play out in the near term will happen this fall. It will happen in South Korea in late October and early November when uh, the world will convene again for another one of these glorious UN conferences. Uh, the prior speaker, 
made reference to the wicket in Dubai. Uh, and I'd like to applaud the Australians for standing beside the United States in that, in that uh, gathering. I was a member of the U.S. delegation. I recall precisely the events that were being described when the conference collapsed on the penultimate night over issues of whether the U.N. would have any kind of authority over the regulation and functioning of the Internet. Um, we're going to be fighting these battles again. We're fighting them right now in the run-up to this meeting, which is called the uh, ITU Plenipotentiary Conference, known by its uh, short name, the Plenipot. At the Plenipot, the ITU is going to be debating its power, its mandate, its authority going forward. And dead center on the agenda is the question of the Internet. Does the ITU have any authority over standards? Does the ITU have any authority to mandate uh, global standards on cybersecurity? Um, does the ITU have any standing to address questions of privacy? So we're debating these now as part of the preparatory process. And um, many of the principles that you guys so thoughtfully advocate in your paper are going to be on the table in a big way in just a matter of weeks. So I applaud you on this timely uh, contribution to the debate. Thank you, Gordon. Appreciate that. Uh, Morgan. So uh, I want to, once again, I'll join Gordon in saying um, thank you very much for a great paper. Um, uh, like Gordon, I'm a regular reader of everything that ITI puts out. Um, and I will say that the one thing in lengthy conversations with Rob about this is that I appreciate the fact that the papers force you to think. Rob, Rob is an enormous advocate for making sure that people know how to think because he believes that knowing how to think teaches you how to write. And if you can do those two things together, the, the world is your oyster. And so I think it's a phenomenal paper because it forced me to think. It forced me to write notes and paragraphs and say, huh, how would this work? But in doing due diligence and in, in coming up with it, I, I tried to come up with some things that I could I might try to reframe or discuss to make it rather than just a big gigantic wet kiss for Dan because we don't want him to get a big head. Um, I thought of three cases, and by the way, for everyone, um, page 13 is the is the flow chart. It's awesome. Pull it out and look at it. But I think I think one of the areas that I had concerns over were there were three cases, and one uh, used the term Daniel fundamental differences on values we should ignore. The problem that I want to make sure we, we understand is there are instances where there are, quote, fundamental differences on values, except that the behavior of the country does not reflect its stated value. Um, the most famous one that we're currently enduring right now is our dear friends in the US government's attitude towards <coughs> Microsoft's holding of data in Ireland on an Irish citizen, which now the US claims that it should have access to under Article 29. The problem with that is, is that I recall the time where the US government was beating on tables insisting that the Chinese government's in, uh, attitudes towards what's time, sometimes called the um, Great Firewall or the Golden Shield, where the Chinese government requires all data on Chinese citizens to be maintained in China, <coughs> candidly for the sole purpose of maintaining control over their population, was somehow an awful evil thought. And yet it's clear that our government, even though the stated value is, is that's a bad behavior that China's engaging in, is stating that uh, don't do what we say, uh, don't do what we do, do what we say, because they are trying to reach across borders and demand information on an Irish citizen held on a cloud server in Ireland and require that it, that information be given to U.S. authorities. So I think we have to, when we look at this framework and this flowchart, one of the areas we have to ask ourselves is um, when, when a country, if they answer these questions honestly, um, yes, they would come to the right conclusion, but sometimes they're um, shall we say, dishonest in their outlook because they have an outcome that may differ from their stated value. So that's one where I think we have to watch out for, and, and I'm picking on the U.S. and the Ireland case because I think it's, a, it's an obvious one for most U.S. citizens, this idea of the U.S. government reaching across um, sovereign boundaries. But the next one comes up, and that's something that, uh, that you addressed a little bit on ICANN, which I would call values differ but outcomes align. And that's an instance where a group of countries who fundamentally have no values in common, whether it be Middle East dictatorships um, and, and others uh, aligning with what we would normally consider very pro-privacy or, or um, laissez-faire countries, because they have an aligned outcome. One of the obvious situations that, that's presented right now is an ICANN one, and that's the idea that through the GAC, um, 
at ICANN, it's possible for governments to get together and essentially demand an entire uh, top-level domain be shut down. Uh, a very good way to look at this is uh, .youtube. So .youtube will be its own top-level domain like .com. Now, um, right now, if there were some, say, somebody posted a YouTube video that made fun of Kamal Ataturk, the Turks would be upset, and maybe they could have that, that information removed within the borders of Turkey. But they don't like the fact that Turkish citizens can tunnel underneath um, through tools and see that video anyway. But maybe another country that doesn't like Turkey at all, maybe you know Indonesia or somewhere else, doesn't like something else that's being said on the YouTube channel. And then maybe the United States doesn't like the fact that there are beheadings videos showing up on this channel and rightfully says that they want those taken down. And so you have a lot of countries that have absolutely dis, uh, no alignment in, in, in their basic core philosophy or value, but they look at the opportunity to go through the gap and demand that ICANN shut down .youtube. And that wouldn't be shutting down .youtube inside of Turkey. That would be shutting it all down because it resides on a top-level domain that they would have some control over. So I think that we have to consider when we look at this flowchart, which, you know, Dan's an honest guy and he builds it with an honest mind and said, we have to remember that sometimes countries operate in ways that we find profoundly disturbing but, ref uh, but um, reflect a, a short-term desire and a desire for some other payout. And I guess the third one uh, that we have to be very careful of as we go through this paper, again, fully supportive, is the use of the internet architecture. One of the things that we experienced with um, China in particular, I'll pick on them a little bit, but they have very good use, is they've understood the value of standards as a competitive tool to enhance their businesses. And so internet architecture seems like a very broad concept. Oh, great, everyone agrees, internet architecture. We all use TCP IP. But what we found in the WAPI standard fight was that China made a difference to the wireless standard for the sole purpose of saying if you want to do Wi-Fi in China, you have to use our standard. And it was a toe dip into seeing if there was a way to use standards organizations to basically, as a competitive tool, force everyone to use Chinese vendors. And so as we look at your model, I think three things that we should think about are how do we make sure that this model, you know, how, does it rep, how does it reflect that, that you know, when people do what they do but not what they say? How do we deal with um, com countries with very va different values seeing a um, short-term advantage to aligning with those who they hate? And then finally, making sure that the term internet architecture isn't um, available to regulatory or um, standard uh, government capture through standards bodies. Otherwise, again, a great paper, and thank you all very much. Wonderful. Thank you, Morgan. Jackie. Well, I think we have a chorus here. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the commendation. I'm on you for criticism. <laughs> well, I'll, 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 I'll raise a few questions, at least, uh, to be helpful. Um, uh, so uh, great work in general, ITIF, I agree. Uh, wonderful thought leadership on all of these uh, complex issues. Uh, so from Verizon's perspective, I want to just uh, sort of start there. Uh, we are, of course, um, a major supporter of the open internet, and we have been working on that in the last few years simultaneously around uh, cross-border data flows, seamless internet, and sort of the commercial space, but also from the point of view of freedom of expression. And those two pieces are very much intertwined. So as I read the paper, I was sort of looking for how that dynamic would be dealt with uh, through this approach. Because we're keenly aware of the need to have even better tools to address both objectives. And I think uh, my, my takeaway was that uh, it's, it's an analysis that does some separation, I think, of those two spaces in order to be more effective but that it, it should be read to mean that in no way does it diminish the need to pursue the freedom of expression objectives. It's just sort of doing them in a different space at times as we look for this sort of hybrid approach or uh, middle ground as, as I was describing. So we certainly agree with the, the premises of the paper in terms of uh, the increase in global nature of internet activities and economic growth, think of the cloud, internet of things, and the public policy development is also increasingly global. I've been so struck, you talked about I've been you know, working in this field for I can't believe it, 20 years, but, <laughs> but just think how different it is now from 2010 or even 15 years ago. 
and we, uh, there, there are these dynamic questions constantly about the relationship between national law and global activities and the role of sovereign decision making. And then, of course, we have this troubling trend in recent years for efforts of national control over residents of data and infrastructure and so on that we've all been working on. So policy frameworks are most welcome for dealing with all of those. Some of my takeaways on the proposed framework, which I do think is, is you know, very constructive, very useful to try to figure out how to work with, uh, this notion of finding a hybrid or a middle ground I think is, a, is, is <coughs> very worthwhile and should enable breakthroughs in the global trade and the ITU discussions in a few months and uh, facilitate the cross-border data flows. And I also think that just the simple notion of analyzing whether there's an extraterritorial impact is incredibly helpful, right? And it is elegantly simple, but just sort of going through the discipline of asking that time and time again in our own analysis and the way we interact with other policymakers, thought leaders, and so on uh, uh, is, is uh, very helpful. I also think that the reference to consensus norms is useful and particularly timely because we're in a period that is rich with examples of attempts to identify those and, and create those. You have a nice list in there of half a dozen examples. Uh, we've been very active as Verizon in many of them. And uh, because we think it is such a, uh, a time of focus on policy development, it's so important to get it right. But oftentimes, the course of those discussions, it's been questioned, well, what's the point, right? Why are we spending time doing these? And then we see here that those could be very useful as determining whether there are norms and consensus as part of the, um, the analysis and the, and the classification. So as I was reading, I thought, OK, so what next? How can this be used? And uh, I'm sure this could be an interesting conversation amongst us. but. I would share some ideas on that. Uh, for example, the, the OECD will hold a ministerial in uh, 2016 on internet and innovation policy, stimulant for growth and jobs, and that seems like an excellent place to try to get this in the mix. And in fact, I was at the uh, Internet Governance Forum in Istanbul last week which I think should be an interesting part of this conversation. And, and uh, one of the senior folks at OECD said, oh, I see you're on a very interesting panel at ITIF. We're looking forward to seeing what the paper is. So there's an opening. Um, applicability to trade negotiations, I thought that was very interesting. Even, the, again, the idea of perhaps taking the multi-stakeholder approach around which we're trying to develop consensus and work that into some trade agreements and there are other projects uh, at the Internet Governance Forum. There, was, there were a number of different workshops and projects on internet and jurisdiction where I think there's a, a very fruitful, probably already on, uh, going on, but certainly the expanded discussion. You mentioned the next, uh, the next ITU meeting, so it'll be useful there. And there will also, uh, there is expected to be uh, further meetings on the international regulations that we looked at. Uh -huh. So, so uh, in such a complex way, shall we say, there will be more of those meetings. And the Internet Governance Forum itself is one of the places where there is a desire to try to reach more and more uh, real conclusions as to what may be right policy. It, this could be helpful there. Having said all that, uh, I do think that as one uh, looks to implement it, I found myself thinking about the complexities I certainly agree with the architecture issue. Uh, it seems like maybe it's really easy to say, it's architecture, let's just cabin this off as universal, that's fine. Uh, but I thought about uh, certain things that one could have a debate over whether those are really architecture and therefore uh, not to be uh, subject of unilateral action. National clouds, routing prescription, rules on encryption, mandatory internet charging arrangements, technical gateway requirements, many of which are moved as standards. Again, a familiar list, one in which we've had lots of disputes. Can we hope to really get those set aside as something that would be universal, or will we continue to de uh, have debates about whether these are local or universal? So, thank Great. you. Thank you, Jack. So let me just make a couple remarks, and then I want to turn it over to Daniel for, for more detailed uh, response to uh, the 
Um, just a couple of quick things. Uh, I think, uh, Gordon, you mentioned this is all coming up into play, particularly around ICANN. I would commend to you a Wall Street Journal op-ed or article was today or yesterday or the day before. Somebody just sent it to me. Uh, it was a very good op-ed on the, on the threat to ICANN and how foreign governments now are actually using the ICANN process, at least the author asserts this, to exert a change in the governance of that. So that's a very live. It may not be as far out in the future as, as, as you suggest. Um, second, Morgan, you mentioned the Microsoft Ireland case. I totally agree. It's a critical case. We just did an op-ed, yes. I guess, on that last, last week. It's on our website if you're interested. Very interesting case about how we're going to go forward on some of these. So just two quick things. One, um, uh, Morgan, you mentioned uh, YouTube domain, and uh, Jackie mentioned extraterritoriality discipline that we try to impose. And I guess the answer to that, and I'll let Daniel go into more detail, but the quick answer would be, in our framework, if you want to do something, that you, I was in Turkey a while back, and they asked me, you know, you know, what do you think of us blocking YouTube? And I was like, if you want to block YouTube, you have a right to do it. You're just hurting yourself by doing it. You just can't block YouTube in my country. Uh, and so I think the framework would be you couldn't block the YouTube domain if you want to mess around with what videos people see in their country. If you can figure out a way to do it, okay. Um, but because it tends to be around content and speech, if you say you don't like, if you don't like Skype for some reason, that's a very different thing because that's around commerce, so you, you couldn't do that. Um, and then the last part I just say is, look, we're not, we're not, uh, we're, we're not uh, neophytes or, or, or you know dreamers that somehow if we come up with this paper that somehow the global conflicts are now solved Why rather <laughs> well with all of your hard work including Senator Conroy's work and maybe we'll get there rather what we're saying is it's important to go into this debate with the right framework to push for the right framework it doesn't mean we're always going to get it but when the framework is squishy or too universalist or this or that if we have the right framework that says let's cordon off architecture let's find those architecture and then USG and other allies can push for that and then we can say, okay, well, you know what? Maybe a spam law in, in, in uh, Lithuania is okay. Uh, how do we, you know, so in other words, getting the framework right, I think, is going to be an important way for us to get there. It doesn't mean we're always going to get there, but I think it's closer to, easier to get better policy if we have the right framework. So, Daniel, if you want to respond. Yeah, I'll just make um, two main points on that. <laughs> the point about the framework is, is really key. I mean, one of the takeaways that we had when we were kind of looking back at Many of the past debates, and you know, we cite many of the, um, you know, a lot of really interesting individuals and groups have tried to put together frameworks and, and their thoughts on how, you know, at a really high level, internet policy should be made. And the critique that we saw again and again with these proposals is that they came from a, a very value-laden perspective. That it, you know, there were a lot of people that agreed with them because they agree with the values, and a lot of people that didn't agree. And so ultimately. You know, in, in these conflicts, in these debates, people were talking past each other. They weren't um, really engaging on something that was meaningful and something you know, where we could actually see progress. And that's why I think we haven't seen progress. We haven't seen a lot of development um, on, on solving some of these bigger issues. Um, and the second point I, I want to make is that you know, I really think um, one of the key issues that emerges from this is the form in which you uh, debate and argue it and you know find resolutions to these conflicts and I think that will shape a lot of this so uh, you know uh, Morgan's point earlier about you can have um, yeah you know differing uh, values but you, you agree on the outcomes right and so you know I think some of that comes from the fact that um, it's it's the forum that you're in and it's the fact that there's not alternative forums so you know if you have groups who agree that you know you know groups for example um, one, one coalition of countries might say, you know, we want to strike down top level domains because we want to make sure there's not online piracy. Another might say it, you know, because we want to control, um, you know, certain types of religious speech. Well, they get together and they agree, well, we agree on this one outcome. If you separate out, you know, the true issues here and you separate out the means and the goals, then maybe you say, you know what, there is actually really broad consensus on, um, you know, dealing with intellectual property, there's not a lot of broad consensus with sensory religious speech. So we have this big coalition that can come together, create a forum for addressing this, and maybe this coalition says, yeah, we want to do that through top-level domains, or maybe they want to do it through some other way, but then they have the group together to actually address those technical issues. And I think when you do that, you also take out some of these policy-laden, value-laden decisions from what should be a very 
technical process like I can. And that's where I think when you're talking about, Jackie, some of the intermingling, I think a lot of it comes about because, you know, ICANN is the forum that people go to, ITU is the forum that people go to. And so they're, you know, they're inherently mixing architecture and values because they have to, because that's the only place for them to deal with it. And they can't say, you know, we're going to try and, you know, it's still a gray line, but we're going to try and be really clear on these gray lines where we can and say, if we think it's a value debate, because we're debating values now, and that's one way to tell it's a value debate, um, we're going to move it to this other forum. And we're going to create another forum to do that. And it's not going to be you know, um, based around you know, engineers. It's going to be based around maybe uh, you know, something else. Um, so, so let me stop there. Um, but you know, I, I want to kind of bring it back to the panel and, and uh, Senator Conroy as well. Um, you know, to this issue of kind of how do we go forward, which which Jackie raised, I think that's really important. You know, how do we how do we think about um, moving from the model we have today, where countries are really pushing their values, to one where they're pushing a set of rules by which which all countries can agree or, or play by these rules. Well. Daniel, I'll start, start with one point, which is, is that that message brought to you by Delta Airlines and United, because that sounds like a lot more international travel for all of us if we have multiple forums. Um, <laughs> but you know, ICANN's recent session was a good example of what you're what you're striving for, and that is how do we have the right governance mechanism for ICANN? How do we demonstrate that ICANN is doing the right thing? And then also, how do you still the board of ICANN if they're failing to do so? Because unlike a, unlike a regular company, ICANN is a company and yet it has no shareholders. You are its shareholders. It has roughly three million, or three billion, how many billion people have three on the internet right now? Yeah. That's its shareholders. And so the question is how do you spill the board of a corporation uh, uh, in that situation where ICANN is failing to do what Daniel outlined? And I think those are the kinds of governance questions that are going to have to be asked by Jackie and those who sit on airplane seats for endless hours. Because I think that that gets to your core fundamental, which is how do we how do we have oversight over these multi forums in a way that the outcome doesn't blow up in our faces? And I, I think you raise a very valid point. Let's separate out let's separate out our peas and carrots, and let's make sure we stay um, stay you know true to what the mission of, it, of each element is. I think that's a it's a very valid point. I already I, I put out my uh, my yeah. examples at the beginning, but I I do think. I mean, as I said, that we are in a period where there's a lot of thinking about these types of issues and whether there should be rules or whether there should be soft law. And, you know, there's just a wealth of opportunities to discuss. Uh, in addition to the, you know, a lot of what I end up in is conversations with uh, governmental and private sector counterparts from around the world. Right? So if you're talking about things like cross-border data flows and so on, uh, I do think there's some elements from this that could just be useful in those types of conversations. Kind of just get it laminated and pull it out on the table when we right. begin? Right. I'm not sure how. Yeah. I'm like, <laughs> just say, like, around excuse me, Bob, are you doing <laughs> right. this because it's architecture? On the or? back of my business card? Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Micro. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. yeah. We should laminate that. Um, so, but we could, I want to open up for questions for, for comments, but just one before we do that. Um, a couple of years ago, there was a researcher here in town at the Wilson Center from Israel, and he was uh, at a university, I can't remember which one, he was writing a book on, on internet and hate speech. And he wrote the book, and uh, but he was interviewing me about it, and he just really fundamentally could not understand sort of the American mindset, like why did we allow uh, anti-Semitic hate speech in the U.S.? Why did we allow Nazi paraphernalia? All, all, not, you know, why could you buy Mein, mein Kampf or get Mein Kampf? And he just couldn't understand it. Just plain it to him, couldn't understand it. He writes the book, and it was a, a very interesting, good book, but it was sort of this view that you just shouldn't be allowed to see this kind of stuff. And, um, you know, it's a legitimate view. It's just not the values that we have in the United States uh, where we, we prioritize free speech. And, and I guess I would just be curious with the, the far four panels, maybe Senator Conrad, because you've, you've confronted that issue in Australia where there's this view that everything should be allowed, but obviously some countries have different views. And how do you do that in a way that doesn't impinge on other people's freedom? Yeah, look, th th this is, this is a, a, a great issue for us to grapple with. But, uh, we, we've confronted it at, 
just very recently in our own parliament. Our Attorney General, our highest number one law officer in the land, announced that he wanted to renounce some of our restrictions on free speech. We have some restrictions around hate speech. We have some restrictions. He very inelegantly described it as Australians have a right to be bigots. This did not go down well. This caused an enormous reaction, and he's now withdrawn his attempts to legislatively change that. And in understanding, I often say, look, I think I mentioned earlier, Hillary speech is exporting your First Amendment. We wouldn't pick it up. We wouldn't pick up your Fifth Amendment right to bear arms. We're not excited about that one. So the European and Australian model evolved from probably the Lockean social contract, which says citizens will come together and give up some of their rights to a government on the basis that it will then oversee and protect in various ways, whereas the American Constitution evolved from a fight against government. And neither of those are in conflict at the macro level. We start in slightly different places, but we ultimately have the same broad set of values. So I can understand why your Israeli colleague could not understand the impassioned defense of all speech is okay. We have race, hate, and hate speech laws in Australia, and up until recently they were very bipartisanly supported across the political divide. So understanding those differences I think will ultimately help us solve this problem. And Daniel described those conversations which are just talking past each other. Getting some of that understanding is right. But if I could just come back to ICANN for a moment. The funniest debate I've seen at ICANN in my time of being involved over the last couple of years was over Patagonia, where there's been an enormous struggle between Argentina, Brazil, and a range of countries about the names, the geographic names being adopted. And there's been a very strong push from the U.S. government to ensure that there is, shall I say, maximum flexibility. In Australia, we don't drink champagne anymore. We drink sparkling wine. Geographic names, that debate's been lost in the trade world, and yet it's coming back in the Internet world. So GAC is actually becoming a debate about trade issues. I've been to GAC at ICANN. I've sat there a while and watched it, and there's don't do it. There is an enormous diversity of views being crammed in and a lot of relitigating of fights from other forums. So this comes back to one of Daniel's points. What forums do we want? ICANN can degenerate to become a de facto relitigating of other forums. It can expand to become a de facto U.N. forum through GAC. It doesn't have the resources to manage that. It's something that is very challenging. So we must decide where we want to litigate these forums. On architecture, I would say that there is probably – it's a mistake to think that the architecture is value-free. And there will be points that the architecture debate goes from just exactly how Daniel's described it. Probably let me give you a simple one. The architecture is written around anonymity. It's fundamentally about anonymity. That's a value. It's not like the air or the sea. They're just neutral and people do things with them. The fiber pipes across the world are their architecture, but the protocols that revolve around them are more complex than simply saying, oh, that's just the architecture. We can leave it at ICANN because those are value judgments that people have written in from the beginnings of the Internet. So there are some things to just add to the mix. I don't have any solutions for them at this stage. I've sat through a lot of these committees. I commiserate having been to an IGF myself. I've been to ICANN and the GAC. I've been to WICCA. 
there is an endless supply of conferences to go to, but relitigating old issues as well as uh, deciding what forums and whether or not ICANN is the appropriate forum. There are plenty of countries who don't believe ICANN is the forum. You've just seen Brazil. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've said to my friends in the, in the US, state and commerce, after Snowden, it gets pretty hard. Uh, after Snowden's re revelations, it gets pretty hard to say, oh, no, we can't afford to let those evil other governments come in and take over and, and change out of ICANN. Uh, we've got a lot less clothes on than we did 12 months ago. That's why we need the Australians to lead the whole fight. Because they don't wear clothes? <laughs> <laughs> other comments, uh, Gordon? Just to pick up on the debate in ICANN. First of all, for those of you who don't know, GATT stands for the Government Advisory Council. And it is um, a very influential player within the ICANN deliberations. And it is an expression of the lack of consensus about the role of government in internet governance to some degree. Um, the debate about ICANN, for some, is a zero-sum game. Um, there are countries like Iran and China and Russia who have said that ICANN's power and authority should not remain quasi-independent or subject to the so-called multi-stakeholder governance model, but it should fall under the aegis of the United Nations. It should fall under the authority of an intergovernmental body. So there's going to be a big debate about that. ICANN's perceived independence has been part of a tug of war that's been going on for years, and I think it's only going to uh, accelerate and mm -hmm. Uh, become uh, more visceral as we debate where we go from a system now where the United States has this power to assign and approve the ICANN contract to some point in the distant future when they don't. Um, we have that authority, the United States, for a period of two years and then another two-year period and then up to 2019, I believe. Um, there are some optimists who think that a new model will be established in 15 months, 16 months. I'm a pessimist. I don't think we're going to get there. So I think we're going to be debating the ICANN issue for some time. That's point one. Point two, within ICANN, you made an excellent comment about who does ICANN report to or who, who, who are the stakeholders on behalf of which ICANN uh, conducts its work. Well, ostensibly it's the global internet community. Well, that's three billion people. If you report to everyone, you report to no one. And there are smart people involved in this debate who realize that. So um, there has been a parallel process set up to create an ICANN accountability mechanism, which right now is debating these really hard questions about how do you ensure 12 months from now or 12 years from now that ICANN is not going to become captive to a coalition of foreign governments or other entities that sort of supersede the authority it's supposed to have. They're asking very difficult questions, hypothetical questions. They're debating quote unquote stress tests, to try to think through scenarios where ICANN's function is potentially subject to the interference of different foreign governments or other entities. We don't know how that is, uh, is, is going to play out, but I'm, I'm, I'm quite confident that as that debate progresses, the role of governments is going to become more pronounced, the role of the GAC is going to be elevated, and you're going to see that debate play out within ICANN and, and particularly within the ITU when we convene in Busan, South Korea on October 20th to begin that debate. And I'll just say a final note on the ITU. It's fascinating. Who is the next Secretary General going to be of the ITU? He's running unopposed. What country does he come from? China. So I, I'm going to make a value judgment since we're talking about values. And I would say it is not a, a good value to have ICANN subsumed by um, ITU. And so I, I, I think Gordon really nailed it. We need to see success from the stress tests. And we need to see success from the folks at ICANN who are working on metrics. Because ultimately, 
Uh, I think it would be an enormous loss, and that yes, that's a value. It's a value term. I think it would be enormous loss for ICANN to disappear and for um, the internet to be controlled by uh, the United Nations. I, I think that I think that's a full stop kind of no, not a good, not a good outcome for everyone. But uh, Gordon's right. That is going to become more and more the debate. We've seen it at previous times where the ITU kind of came a calling and, and started talking about how they should take over all of the architecture functions from ICANN, the IANA contract, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, you're exactly right, and everyone knows that the Snowden situation, or I didn't mention it, but that is the preeminent example of the fundamental differences between what you say and what you do. The United States, well, the senator was talking about Hillary Clinton's speech and the importance of, of how we behave, and yet when our own country behaves in a way that even the own citizenry finds unacceptable. It, it, it destroys our ability in all of these forums for a, for a, to make the case that you laid out and that Daniel a lethal, you made out. A lethal attack on our credibility and our yes, legitimacy absolutely. in this debate. Absolutely. Uh, Jackie, and then we'll open it up. So uh, just to fill out the picture on venues, right, we've been talking a lot about ICANN and the ITU, and I do want to reiterate that there's a whole sort of uh, separate multi-stakeholder opportunity, which is the Internet Governance Forum, and uh, that is truly all the different stakeholder groups. It has not been decisional to date, but there is a strong desire there, so please watch that space and think about engaging in it, because there's a strong desire to have outcomes. It will meet next year, I believe it's expected to be in November in Brazil. Brazil is a very strong player in both the multi-stakeholder venue and the multilateral ITU venue. And they don't and, always match. Uh, <laughs> their views in each? Yeah, or, they yeah. don't always match. Even the views in each? Yeah. Um, but, but I think there's actually, well, anyway, I don't want to talk, I get, <laughs> Brazil is very interesting, but the main point I wanted to make now is that, that those opportunities are there, they are moving, there's likely to be the development of uh, more and more documents that are expected to be a reflection of sort of consensus across the stakeholder group. So I think we really need to pay attention to that uh, and, and uh, see it as a place to try to move these types of ideas because if we don't get in and engage, uh, there, it could be problematic. Uh, outcomes. So. Great. Uh, so if you have any questions or comments, you just want to raise your hand, identify yourself. Uh, yes, sir, in the back, and then right here. Is there a, is there a mic? Or? No, you, we yeah, should hear you. The mic oh. pick it up. Oh, I'll just step up. Yeah, uh, Phil Corlin, and uh, I didn't expect to hear so much about ICANN at a uh, uh, conference uh, meeting on jurisdiction, but I want to just fill in the picture with what's going on there. Right now, ICANN the U.S. has said they want to transition the IANA functions, but they want to make sure that ICANN doesn't become an intergovernmental organization or government control, and they also want enhanced accountability. But <coughs> for some reason, in the middle of this process, the board has put out a proposal to amend its bylaws to make it much more difficult for the board to reject advice from the GAC. And I just filed a letter for a client, and every letter filed on that so far, the comment period is still open strongly opposes it. I don't know why they put it uh, out there. At the same time, there are nations within the GAC, including the EU, over a trade issue, which is geographic indicators for the dot wine and dot bin new top level domains, want to change the method by which the GAC gives advice from strong consensus to just majority vote, which would change things quite a bit. And then Iran has just filed an amendment for the ITU meeting to make ICANN advice no longer advice but directives to ICANN, uh, which if that passes the ITU could be very dangerous. You have all this going on, and on accountability, it would be great if we were discussing all those new ideas for accountability, but actually what's going on is a huge split between the entire ICANN community and the senior staff over their proposed process for designing accountability, where the community has risen up the board has met, the staff has managed to sign. it's never occurred before. They've united the entire ICANN community, it's unprecedented, to protest the proposed process for setting new accountability standards because the community thinks it's it's designed to basically distill whatever, you know, uh, whatever they propose and give the board unbridled discretion to reject it. So all this is going on and uh, 
the next ICANN meeting, I'm, unlike most of them, is very close. It's in Los Angeles in mid-October, so uh, for those interested in these issues, as they're going to be debated on ICANN, it's not that difficult to go uh, and see them firsthand uh, uh, next month. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Yeah, as I said, uh, thanks, Phil. And um, if anyone here hasn't seen it, um, on our blog innovation files, we released a set of uh, key principles for accountability that um, you know, have been put forward not just by ITIF, but some other groups and stakeholders. And it's really you know, around this idea of you know, the US government has said it wants accountability, but it hasn't defined it yet. And it's, you know, it'll be really critical that uh, eventually NTIA is going to have to um, come forward and say what exactly they mean by accountability. And, and so now is the time to have that debate about what goes into that. What kind of oversight do you need? Um, you know, what, what do those principles look like? How do you have clear separation of duties? Uh, so if you haven't seen that, I encourage you to check that out. Yes, sir. Um, thanks. Um, my name is David Post. I've been, uh, I was a law professor at Temple University, uh, just retired. Um, been thinking about these issues. David Johnson and I wrote a paper about cross-border policy things. Seems like a hundred years ago. I read it. Cyrus Very good. <laughs> um, and it seems to me, maybe this is obvious. Um, uh, from the discussion, uh, but there, there's a connection between the framework and all this discussion about ICANN that I think is, is worth making a, a little more explicit, maybe, than it has been made. But it seems to me the connection is this. So ICANN is under this enormous pressure um, uh, to expand its mandate beyond the merely technical uh, domain name database management function that it has been harder to serve, to get into content regulation, speech regulation, cybersecurity, and anonymity, et cetera, et cetera. Um, precisely because, in a way, the cross-border policy conflicts have been so hard to solve any other way. That is because the, 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 the legal system has responded so clumsily, in a way, to the problem you're addressing with the framework. Um, that has pushed people, in a sense, to look at ICANN as sort of the uh, a, a, a venue in which these issues can be addressed and addressed, as someone said, you know, dot YouTube. You want something off? It's off. You know, you can make things disappear uh, through ICANN. Um, uh, so the framework is connected to the ICANN debate. It seems to me, in sort of a two, there's a two-part strategy you're talking about. One is on the ICANN side to sort of hem them in, keep them accountable. Um, keep them working on, you know, not so they don't turn themselves into an intergovernmental organization, a new UN, to keep them on the technical side, making sure the databases resolve and that the internet continues to function, while at the same time, sort of the framework is designed to deal with these more difficult, sort of higher level, in a sense, policy conflicts. Um, or, and, and to the extent that is successful, it actually feeds back, it makes people more comfortable than having ICANN in. I mean, I think there's a real feedback between the two. If, if there's a way to solve these policy conflicts without bringing ICANN into it, if there's some sort of progress on that front, then it, people become more comfortable with the idea that ICANN stays in its corner, as it were, uh, as, a, uh, as, a, as a purely technical sort of uh, database manager. I'm curious if you have anyone has a reaction. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I agree with that. And I, I'd add to it, I mean, part of it is also that um, you know, countries will not be turning to the ITU to solve these problems as well. Correct. And so that that also alleviates um, that pressure because wow. right now, you know, I can you know, it, I can is the juicy totally target. If, if you're a universalist, that's where you go to. You right. know, if you can get them to pass your policy, you win. Game over. So, I think it's worth pointing out though that the 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 senior leadership at ICANN from Fadi Shahadi down, ostensibly in terms of their declared interest doesn't want to touch this stuff because they acknowledge that they don't have the capacity to resolve these issues that other mechanisms and fora have failed to resolve. So I think ICANN has wisely, in terms of its declaratory policy, said we want to remain a narrowly focused technical organization related to the navigational architecture of the internet. And if they can resist this pressure to take on these quasi-insoluble global policy problems, that's probably good for ICANN in the future. 
Other, yes, sir. Uh, hi, uh, Joe Wright from Bloomberg BNA. Uh, so, I think that one of the things that was discussed at the IGF USA uh, was that the proliferation of fora can actually be problematic in a multi-stakeholder process because it's more difficult to participate when there are a thousand events. You talked about, you know, the airlines sponsoring uh, all this discussion. Um, and so, does that mean that government, you know, if we have a more of a proliferation of fora, our government's going to have a bigger role in in the multi-stakeholders, and I mean, in a sense, democracy can be a multi-stakeholder model, ideally. Uh, and so, are, are governments going to have to do more of the work of the multi-stakeholderism and representing uh, people's interests if, if these forums are going to proliferate, or do you see a way that, it, that these various fora can be multi-stakeholders? Uh, I would point out one interesting thing that your comment is happening when we have somebody from the other side of the world here who didn't get on an airplane who's participating. It's not ideal, but, you know, we're not quite, my daughter will invent the teleporter, I've decided. But until we get to that stage, I mean, there are, we are, there are techniques. We see his smiling face there with his white headphones to allow participation by broader, by broader constituencies that may not be able to get on an airplane. I don't think that's a, a full answer to your question about multiple fora, but I think that we are, I think it's something we, we need to address and we need to do a better job with exactly what Rob has done here by bringing other voices in from the around the world without putting them on a plane. Other thoughts? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I'll add that, you know, I, I think one of the challenges that ICANN's had, and, you know, it's, it's you know, it is new, and, you know, I, I give it credit for, um, you know, experimenting with this new model. Um, you know, it's, it's basically trying to figure out how how do you bring together so many people and, and get voices heard. And, you know, the goal with that was that it would be the best ideas rise to the top. I don't think they've achieved that yet. I think it's still a lofty goal. But that, that is the idea with, you know, these multi-stakeholder environments, that one good idea will be embraced by whoever's there and it will rise to the top. I think the way it works right now, it's you know, if you have a lot of resources and you have a lot of time and you have a really loud voice, you're more likely to be heard and you're, you're able to keep, you know, your message um, out there. So we need to change that. And I think part of, you know, figuring out these forums is also figuring out how they work well and dealing with those types of problems. Um, the way I can structure right now, it, it is very much, you know, if you have a lot of resources, you're likely to be better than if you don't. Yeah, you know, I just uh, go ahead, Senator. I just spent 12 months on the ICANN accountability transparency review uh, and one of the great pushbacks from the, the <coughs> community was over the status of gap and they felt and were very strongly trying to take away or at least elevate themselves as a community through their their other component parts and there's ALAC and uh, there's more acronyms than you could shake a stick at. Uh, and so there was great resentment from the uh, internet community about the evolving role of GAC. So uh, on the one hand, the GAC secretariat barely had funding to manage these massive meetings. Uh, and Helen, who uh, chaired the GAC, uh, deserves a medal on all of our behalves. Uh, so there's a great tension on the ART to about what role the component parts had. And the more and more governments were joining and Fadi has reached out to try and head off the push for the ITU. And he's, he's done a lot of reforms to try and bring governments into the process. That's created a backlash from that broader internet community uh, that see the governments being elevated to a, a greater position within the decision-making process. So uh, it doesn't surprise me there's been a, a, a bit of a revolt. Uh, that tension is going to increase. There are those who believe that this is a forum we have to have greater government involvement in, and the US even considered not registering uh, XXX in, in the absolute 
route source code at one point as a demonstration, and that was something all governments virtually around the world uh, objected to uh, what ICANN were doing. So the accountability of the ICANN board process and staff is a constant, constant tension. Uh, and so it doesn't surprise me to see a pushback that uh, has been described. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so maybe your last question and then I'll wrap it up with some final <coughs> questions. Sir. Greg Nojai from the Center for Democracy and Technology. Um, to the Senator, I wonder if the Attorney General could have gotten his way if instead of posing it as Australians have a right to be bigots, <coughs> Australians have a right to criticize bigotry, <laughs> but they have to know about it. Uh, that, that's not my question. My question was to Dan and to Morgan. It's to take the Microsoft Ireland case. U.S. wants its warrants to reach data stored abroad. Run it through the decision tree on page 13 and tell me where you come out. I come out in the bottom right box that the U.S. should be finding policy alternatives that don't affect people outside its borders, and yet they do. They want the data of the person outside its borders. Or what? It should work to build consensus that every country's warrants reach outside its borders? That's what I'm yeah. struggling with on the decision tree. So, yeah, so I mean, I, and, um, definitely I'll, I'll send you our, uh, our the blog we just did on this because we try and get to that issue specifically. Um, you know, we have the mutual legal assistance treaties, and, and the criticism in this case was that it, it's not fast enough. Um, that it doesn't work well enough, and that's why you know the U.S. had to pursue this other avenue. And so, uh, what we said in this piece was that you know if if that's the case, we need to fix the MLAT process so that it works for everyone. Um, and that is you know that is so that would be on the bottom left that you know countries should be working together to pursue policies. Um, or I guess it's the, the middle left. Where am I on there? Uh, it's, yeah, yeah, the bottom yeah, left. So bottom they, left yeah, they, yeah. So you know, minimize impact outside the jurisdiction, but work to build international agreements in this area. And so this is an area where we can work to build international agreements. Um, this is a case where, you know, there, there is a, a valid need for, for law enforcement. There's a, a valid need to protect data. There's a, a really good reason not to just try and force countries, uh, force companies to turn over data just because they're within your jurisdiction, even though you, you maybe can do it, but we say you shouldn't do it. So that's, that's where I think it comes out for me when we do it. So, so I think the one problem is is that our law enforcement often looks at these extraterritorial searches um, not from the perspective of, of we want to go after a foreign citizen, but it's cloaked in the, well, but something bad might happen to an American. And so I think what happens with a lot of our, our law enforcement discussions about these spaces is it actually ends up early on the uh, country should, you know, we should, they should act unilaterally because an American might be harmed by something a foreigner is doing and the data that's stored for in, a, in a foreign location, if we had access to it, we won't have the next 9-11. And unfortunately, on a lot of these questions, that is the flow chart that law enforcement uses. You're right about MLAP, completely agree with your assessment, but oftentimes the discussion uh, that you and I have had with law enforcement sometimes derives to the level of, why don't you have a warrant? Well, pedophiles and terrorists will win. And that's, that's, that's a conversation stopper, right? I mean, that's the problem is when you ask for things like a warrant standard, and the law enforcement personnel come back and say, pedophiles and terrorists. And so on your flowchart, I think it's great. And I think your answer is correct to, uh, to Greg. But I do think we have to be realistic about how a law enforcement official sees this flowchart. And he'll see it as pedophiles and terrorists, therefore, yes. And, and that will answer, it, it scrapes the entire rest of the flowchart off. That, that's always the winning answer. Yeah. And well, and that's, I mean, that was the Snowden problem, right? I mean, right. You know, we had not law enforcement, the intelligence community is saying, this is our flow chart. We do what we want. <laughs> We're about to Can we get it? Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. Full stop. All right, so we're going to send this report to the NSA after after this. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Don't worry. Yeah. They have actually all nine versions. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes, And I think some of their edits on that were. Yeah. <laughs> they did that. But weird. Uh, so let me just close with one, one comment, which is, um, You've been talking a little bit about forums or for us, and 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 you know we try all these things we do, and it seems to me the one thing we haven't had a meeting on is the framework. Yeah. We haven't really had a serious global conversation about a framework 
We fight about particular issues, we fight about particular values, but it, unless we get a framework in place that people generally agree, that's why we had the GAF, that's why we had the WTO, it was a framework. Then we can argue about whether Airbus subsidizes, and Europe subsidizes Airbus, or whether you know, we subsidize agriculture, but unless you have the framework, and I guess our message would be, it's worth spending the next year or so developing the framework, so everybody can say, yeah, okay, that's a problem, it falls under this box. We're going to deal with it this way. Now, you might not like it, but it's in that box, and we can go with that. Um, again, I don't know how realistic that is, but I do think it's probably the best path forward if we're going to really make any progress in this space. Uh, so with that, I want to thank, uh, first of all, all of you for joining us and our uh, four great uh, speaker in getting there, Morgan, and our three panels here, but also Senator Conroy for staying up way, way past his bedtime <laughs> <laughs> and joining us uh, from the other side of the world. So uh, thank you, Senator, as well, and uh, please join me in thanking a great panel.